This is the European edition of Breaking Banks, the world's number one fintech podcast and radio show. We bring you the European unicorn startups, founders, regulators and leaders innovating the rapidly evolving fintech scene today. A truly localized podcast with both English and local language content with some of the world's most well-known hosts and influencers in the fintech sector globally. Join us every week as we explore what makes the European Union a phenomenal proving ground for many of the fastest growing fintech plays in the world today. Okay, let's roll. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another session of Breaking Banks Europe. We're now at episode 172, and you're listening to the Ecosystem Zoom In, the Austrian case. I'm very much looking forward today to have some special hosts, uh, co host with me today to discuss what's going on in the startup ecosystem in Austria. Markus Raunig is with me. Very much welcome, Markus. Hi, thanks for, for the invite. Great, great if you could join. And Gabriele Tatsberger. Hello, also from my side. Nice that you could join. Uh, I think you've got a really nice network in Austria and are very, very well fed in to what's going on and on the ground. And uh, I think uh, all our listeners are very keen to listen now on what's actually going on in the ecosystem. So I'm curious, could you briefly perhaps already give a bit of a background track on what you're working on and what your connection to the startup ecosystem is? Uh, Gabriele, can I start with you? Mm -hmm. Could you explain a bit on what, what you're working on these days? Yeah, sure. So I'm Director of Startup Services at the Vienna Business Agency, and we are there supporting startups with different kinds of services, with workshops and coachings. We also have many grants programs, so we also support uh, startups and companies financially. And we also have a big real estate department, so we are also developing um, uh, real estates. For example, we opened uh, last year a co-working space for life science startups because we saw that laboratory infrastructure wasn't available uh, in, in, um, in a way it was needed. Um, and we are also organizing the International Decentral Startup Festival Vienna Up which is coming up soon. So I will tell you uh, when is this? a little bit more, but it's end of May, beginning of June. Okay. And I really invite you because I can tell you a little bit more later. On. It's uh, also not just the um, and startup festival. It's also to get to know the city and it's very broad uh, with many different topics uh, from digital ICT topics to manufacturing, smart cities impact. Uh, so there's a very broad range for investors, startups and corporates to join in. Uh, and, be and besides that, I'm also um, in the advisory board of a uh, high-tech uh, incubator in it. Uh, it's a university spin-off in incubator. And we are also very active internationally. We have welcoming uh, programs for international startups with our okay. Vienna Startup Package. Um, and we are also active in uh, several startup city networks internationally. So mm -hmm. it's very broad range of things I'm doing. I like so it. You're indeed quite busy there on uh, all sides of the startup ecosystem. Uh, thanks, Gabriele. And these are definitely some topics to touch upon uh, uh, in a bit. Uh, Marcus, love to learn more about uh, what you're up to these days. <laughs> yeah, my main job is I'm the chairman of Austrian Startups. Austrian Startup is a non-profit umbrella platform for startups in Austria. So we're mostly doing, on the one hand, community work. So um, organizing lots of events all over Austria. We also a think tank, so we publish um, the leading startup report uh, with, within the ecosystem, and nice. we're also an education platform. So we're running um, educational um, programs in schools and for high potentials later on. On the other hand, I'm also um, part of the startup uh, council of the Austrian startup gov uh, Austrian government, and I'm also co-hosting a podcast called Future Weekly, one of the leading tech podcasts in Austria. Great. Well, it's indeed also uh, quite busy uh, on that side. Quite, quite curious actually to touch upon already on one thing is uh, your connection with uh, the government in uh, in Austria. Uh, is that like a specific council that advises the government uh, about startup business? How does that work? Exactly. It's a, a council um, based in the Federal Ministry of Labor and Economy. And um, our goal there is to um, share the startup reality with political decision makers and make sure they 
um, are properly prepared to make the decisions um, for for a future Austria that is welcoming to innovators and, and create an environment um, that fosters entrepreneurship. Hmm. Uh, great already, I think, to know to learn uh, that there is this connection where, uh, let's say, the market at least is in conversation with the government to look after the the the, the situation and the facilities that the government should provide. Um, do you feel that that's a, is that a fruitful collaboration? Do you see that there's a strong openness also from government to support startups and and understand what innovation needs to to thrive? <laughs> Well, the doors are open and we are listened to, but on the other hand, I think the execution is is still lacking or there's still room for improvement there. I think in, we managed to get on an Austrian startups level, we have an Austrian startup agenda. It's a, a program that we suggest yeah. to make Austria more entrepreneurially friendly. And we put forward 37 recommendations um, in that. Okay. And wow. 18 of those were, made it into the government program but only three or four, three and a half have actually been implemented. So there is still a lot of room for okay. improvement. I think that is actually something that's that's across the board, across Europe, you'll see that governments have a willing uh, willingness to, to listen and, and explore, but it, it, there's a long way to implementation uh, that's recognizable in any case. Uh, yeah. But at the same time, it's also good that there are these, these support programs, for example, as Gabriele was describing. I think it's quite interesting to learn a little bit more about that, uh, perhaps, uh, Gabriele, because I, I guess that the government is also involved there uh, in these support programs. Exactly. Yeah, because we are owned by the city of Vienna, so to say, but we are an agency construction, so not administration, so we have a little bit more flexibility maybe than the administration. And what we are really doing is supporting company founders and startups that would like to found their company here in Vienna. Mm -hmm. yeah. For example, we newly have a startup um, founder stipendia. So the people who are living here for one year can get a stipendia for six months and they get money in order to prepare the business model. But we also have um, coachings, free of cost coachings and workshops. So basic coaching, then uh, ex expansion coaching, and also very new now impact coaching, because we deeply believe that also in the business modeling, you have to think about your ecological and social impact you are yeah. provoking. Uh, and uh, we have also international incoming programs. One of it is uh, the Vienna Startup Package, where globally startups can apply, and we invite every year 15 of them to come for one month uh, to Vienna during Vienna Up. But we also have thematic focused uh, Discover Vienna programs that are shorter programs, one week. And we invite here also international startups in order to check out if this Vienna could be a good opportunity. And besides the services, we also our grants uh, can be applied from international startups, even without having still a company here in Vienna. And if they get... Um, uh, the funding, then they have a cer certain period of time where they can implement the project here in the end, and it's up to 400,000 euros you can get in order to really further innovatively uh, develop your uh, product further. So these are some examples. Uh, and maybe for the Vienna Up, this International Startup Festival, it's not the festival from us, the Vienna Business Agency. We are the initi initiator and curator, but the real um, actors are uh, stakeholders, uh, startup stakeholders out of the city or international stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So there are more than 30 partners who are organizing more than 60 international events from hackathon, matchmaking events, conferences to the specific topics uh, from creative days, manufacturing, uh, impact, etc. Health yep. Summit will take place. And we, so to say, just um, we bundle all our power we have here. And I think this is something very uh, specific for Vienna that the stakeholders really believe that in bundling our forces, we are stronger. And yeah. this is why this Vienna Up can happen uh, at all, because without that, it wouldn't be manageable. No, uh, sure. and, yeah. and this is also what we see for our international guests. So last year we had 10,000 visitors that they really like that they come for five to nine days and they have every stakeholder they need, so to say, uh, accessible within that period. And yeah. this is Quite very nice attractive. Treatment. Yes. Yeah. 
And so do you see that, let's say, are there any specific targets or numbers on, for example, the number of uh, foreign startups that get attracted like that? Um, is there is there some 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 sense of how, yes. how well it's working? Um, yeah, uh, last year was, you know, due to COVID, we weren't sure yet if we can fully yeah. implement it. So it was a hybrid event, but the guests, of thir- 35% of all the guests were internationals. So we hope to increase this number this year. Uh, but it was also um, uh, remote possible to participate this year. It's really on site. There are just few um, events um, in a digital form, but because really also the organizers see that it's of value to personally meet and talk with each other. But we have a very good, we were around, we were now in America and in Asia and you know, they really, if there is someone who is interested in Austria in any way, this is a perfect opportunity to sneak into the ecosystem and see if it has something to offer for you or not. And this is also the, what we see that many delegations that will come this year from all over the world because this is easy for, an easy access for them. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think I, I think in general you see that uh, uh, people that are in a, their discovery phase to discover uh, uh, an ecosystem to decide whether to land there, generally these kind of uh, larger events are a really good place to start. Um, and so generally, uh, Marcus, do you see that resonates also with the local ecosystem? Do you see that they really benefit as well from such a from such a large event and and also international stakeholders coming together? Definitely. I mean, Austria is a small country, so we need that international connections. That's also something that most startups in Austria, they really, they are international from day one. Um, they they see the global market from day one. It's not first the Austrian, then the German. Usually you try to really be global from the beginning. And in, in that sense, every opportunity to connect with international stakeholders is is definitely a good opportunity. Great. Yeah, it's good to. Uh, I think that's that's. You basically see that very often when these larger events uh, c- come to thrive, that also the local ecosystem begins to thrive as well. So, and how do you? How would you relate that? Into, uh... I just. I would. Ju- I would just like to add. Um, yeah, the event, the festival, is from the local uh, ecosystem. It's a, a. It's an ecosystem event because really all the stakeholders are bringing in their events. So this is exactly. different I, to yeah. many other events, you know, maybe. No, exactly. But I think indeed the fact that it reaches this scale uh, means a lot for the ecosystem, right? So I think uh, yeah, it could sure. be a 500 people event, but if it's a 10,000 people event, it has much more impact uh, because it's, it's, it's at some point it creates some gravity that attracts more uh, mm-hmm. by itself. Yeah. And, and obviously it's also easier to, to attract international people if you have several... Um, events within a week. So this is then something where you you have multiple touch points and then you stay for the whole week on you and you see, also see other perspectives from the ecosystem. So that that is definitely the aim here. Yeah, great. Uh, and which is curious, Marcus, uh, I think you also do quite some research into the developments in the market, uh, how many startups are starting and what their challenges are. Uh, how do you see that ha- developing over the past uh, over the past years, uh, following COVID, where there probably were some uh, some challenges uh, uh, as well? Um, just curious as well, where, how you see that evolving afterwards? Yeah, I mean, we saw a strong growth in the number of startups being founded from pretty much 2011 until 2017, and since then we are pretty much being stable. So it's about 350 startups being founded every year. Um, And and we define startups as innovative, growth-oriented companies that, um, yeah, that are younger than 10 years. So this is the definition. And if you take that, then it's 350 per year. So that means uh, overall, we have about 3,000 startups at the moment in Vienna or in Austria, in, in, in Vienna, it's about half of that. So half of the startups from Austria are based in Vienna. And yeah, we we obviously saw that the, the recent crisis has also been challenging for, for, the, for the startup ecosystem. So both Corona, um, where some, some industries are hit really hard, tourism, gastronomy, and stuff like yeah. that, where then also startups who have 
solutions for these industries are obviously suffering. But also now the crisis, uh, the energy crisis, the general crisis of liquidity that we have, the rising rates, um, this is all having an effect on startups. So if, if you look at the second um, half year of 2022, and compare it to the second half year of 2021, then the investments, um, yeah, they, it was a decrease by 80% in, in the investment volume in Austria. So this is is something that's obviously a global macro problem. Yep. But yes, Austrian startups are affected. Yeah, that is recognizable in any case, indeed. Uh, you see that definitely is, several industries got hit at different uh, moments uh, uh, by this. But I think it's that you actually were able to keep the levels of 2017 stable. I think it's quite uh, quite a win because I think across Europe, mm-hmm. you actually see a decline in the number of startups. So mm-hmm. I think from that perspective, it's, uh, it's relatively positive that you were able to maintain the numbers. Mm-hmm. But I also see that as generally a really, it's a big problem for Europe. That the number of startups is declining. I, I strongly believe that that's the, the the biggest opportunity we have is that we increase the number of founders, the number of startups, because those are the people who will solve these huge problems that that are in front of us, from climate to energy to the pension problem. I, I believe it, it needs this entrepreneurial spirit, and the fact that that we are plateauing or 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 actually decreasing the the number of startups that's that's alarming to me. I agree. Yeah. And I think, uh, yeah. So I, I think it, it potentially there's a lot of uh, reasons to call to call for that, which I think is I think the the, the regulatory environment is harsh. Uh, basically, the remote working has uh, uh, stopped, uh, for example, the the, the creation of uh, new startups, with just less creativity available, but also the availability of uh, relatively easy jobs compared to uh, the harsh road of actually uh, starting your own company uh, might also have basically contributed to that. But maybe also uh, to react on that, what we see is, especially in the information and communications technology and also in the fintech sector, the development was very good over the last years. So uh, it really depends on the sector you are uh, looking at. Okay, maybe in blockchain crypto, we had some struggles over the last month. But in general, we see that there are more startups in the field of life science and fintech also in Vienna. And they, uh, and they are performing very good. And this is also why more and more meetups and, and events are going on in this uh, life science and fintech field here in Vienna because there, uh, this, this COVID and all the struggles we are facing also um, uh, promoted the digitalization and also offered new opportunities for these kind of companies. So uh, I would say it really depends on the sector you're looking at. Uh, I agree. I think it definitely it's, it's really industry specific. Uh, and interestingly enough, we actually did, recently did a Breaking Banks uh, Europe session on Bitpanda. Uh, so uh, if you want to dive in more into the crypto world uh, from Vienna, uh, you definitely should check that out. Um, and I think indeed, let's say crypto has been a spe- very special case, but I think in general digitization took quite a big leap. How far did it go in, in Austria? Do you see as well that there's was there a big changeover from uh, uh, mm. on-premise uh, physical services towards uh, digital well, payments and digital services? Yeah, so what we really see is I, I was uh, uh, traveling around a lot and what I really uh, recognized is that we are very far when it comes to digitalization, also of administrative processes. For example, in health sector, we have one e-card and you can go with this e-card to every doctor all over Austria and it just works uh, or all the processes in uh in order to uh, uh, really do your administrative st- stuff like passports, etc., this is really digitalized a lot already. And yep. at the city of Vienna, with the zero emissions aim we are having, we are working now a lot with digital twins in order to yep. make the process more efficient. Uh, and also in the fintech sector, uh, we see many companies that really try to make these processes more efficient, optimize them, and also. In the field of open data, um, the city of Vienna really provides a lot of open data and there is also specific open data conferences going on in order to really boost this uh, topic always. So this is very important for Vienna with the regard to also digital humanism, which means uh, techno- technologies should be good for the people and not just, uh, you know, that someone earns money. So also always the question, what does... 
uh, this technology do with our society? You know, we have faced this, uh, topics like um, uh, that also Bernie Lee Sanders said that um, the, the system is failing, the internet is failing. Uh, we have this bubble bubbles, uh, we have these filter bubbles, we have these uh, biases within AI and social media, and also not the ownership about data at the people. And this, this is a very hot topic also for uh, Vienna to really make steps in that direction that technologies should always have in mind uh, this um, uh, human, humanism side of what's going on. Does that get a lot of focus in the in the the also the the programs that you run uh, with startups? Yes. I know you focus on impact a lot, right? But I think it's yes, the, um, I think this is, is quite a challenge. Uh, exactly. So what we are doing there is um, from the University of Technology in Vienna, they started a global discourse about this topic of uh, digital humanism, and we did together with another funding agency now a call in order to um, 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 support projects that are dealing with this. Uh, digital humanism side. So in companies and researchers are working together in order to find out new solutions uh, for different topics um, within the digital humanism. So this is what we're doing now. And also the city of Vienna really tries to be very aware about what data they get, how to handle that, uh, what is open data, how we can synthesize this open data in order to be also worthwhile for research and also startups. So there are many discourses going on around yeah. that. And that's also reflected yeah. in the numbers. So if you if you look Austrian-wide, around half of the startups we have here are actually working on a social or environmental problem. Okay. Yeah, I think that's interesting as well to, to see that there's so much focus on that. Uh, but I need uh, the fact that this is part of your conversation uh, on policy level as well as between founders uh, would really help there, I think, to, to, to help everyone uh, find their way uh, at that level. Uh, quite interesting. Um, uh, on that note, I'd actually love to explore a bit more, uh, you know, what exactly these startups are working on and which markets they're trying to serve, for example. But it would be a really good idea to actually talk about that after a short break. So I'd love to see you all in a bit. Just a minute. Pit Panda Technology Solutions is the most scalable investing as a service infrastructure available in Europe and globally. The platform allows fintechs, traditional banks, and online platforms to offer trading, investing, and custody services across stocks, ETFs, cryptocurrencies, precious metals, and commodities. Partners can build their own user experiences on an ISO 27N1 certified and battle proofed infrastructure. This infrastructure is set up as a modular system to enable our partners to pick and choose from our features such as saving plans, asset to asset swaps, crypto staking, fractionalized stocks our full blockchain and more services via one API connection. Bitpanda, your design or technology. Go to bitpanda.com for more. Yes, welcome back to episode 172 of Breaking Bank Europe, the ecosystem zoom in to the Austrian case. Um, I'm talking to uh, Gabriele Tatsberger and Markus Raunig. Um, Markus, um, can you tell us a bit more, perhaps, uh, I think you've got quite some data about the startups in the Austrian ecosystem. Um, uh, where, where are they coming from and where are they going to? Where, where, how do you see them actually move internationally? Really curious about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, generally about a quarter of the, the, the startups being founded um, are founded by people with a migration background. So we see the scene itself is very international. Also, all events that we organize uh, as Austrian startups, they're all in English on right. purpose because we know that it is an international scene. And uh, globally, for sure, um, if, if we talk about international, going international, then Germany is a, a logical place for many startups to have a base but then yep. for sure also america is interesting also asia is interesting the middle east is interesting so austria has always been a hub um, between different worlds um, a diplomatic hub and yep. uh, you can also feel that when it comes to entrepreneurship it's nice so, so do you think let's say i think a lot of people might expect that uh, for example working with uh, the german region would be relatively easy but is that also the case from a, a legislation perspective is is everything kind of synchronized or do you still feel that there might be some hurdles actually crossing that border 
I think this border is definitely one of the easiest to cross. For sure, there are differences and it's important to be mindful of them. But yes, we we do have quite a lot of synchronization between the Austrian and the, the German government. So often if Germany does something, Austria also checks or the, they, they also want to do it similarly. So I think that is, is, is an advantage. Um, but uh, I think generally... Um, what what is a, a strength of Austria is that we have a strong network uh, also in all the different countries in the world. There is a, obviously dip, diplomatic relationships, but there's also the economic relationships. There's mm-hmm. often what we call the Außenwirtschafts uh, Center, where yep. you have someone who actually can really help you with business development there. And then sometimes I I know that startups coming and saying that's crazy. They are actually doing my my sales over there. Um, so this is actually something that can be quite helpful. Yeah, I do recognize that as well uh, uh, here. And But I know indeed not all countries are that proactive in promoting their companies. So I think that's definitely an asset uh, from the Austrian side. Um, and so I think that that's interesting. Let's say I, I happen to know that uh, uh, Österreich actually means uh, border country, border uh, right, uh, right uh, no, empire might be the right word. <laughs> um, but it's actually nice to to actually, you, so you're really, because there, there is a, an interesting border, right, between sort of Eastern and Central Europe and uh, Western Europe. I think you're really sort of on the border there. Um, and so do you see as well that do you get a lot of influx from uh, from uh, Eastern European uh, people that are are interested to to found a company or with solutions uh, and the other way around? I think that's, that crossover is really valuable. Uh, yes, we see that a lot because uh, many people are also living in Vienna coming from these countries. So we there are many people who know the language and also the culture. And it's also because that we have many consultancy companies, insurance companies, but also banks who are very active in the Central Eastern European market. Uh, so this is also why many headquarters for Central Eastern Europe are located in Vienna. Uh, and we also have this incoming program. To, uh, and what he, we he see here is really that for these international startups, uh, this market entry opportunity in the German-speaking market, but also in the Central Eastern European market, here Vienna is very attractive because this know-how is here and yep. people can really easily link into that and uh, check out if, if the markets are interesting for them or, or not. Uh, so I, I uh, and the other side really is that these international startups tell us, okay, from Asia and US, they have a more global market uh, global view they really check out okay could it be a good entry point for europe so they check out on a more global view but uh, we see that with these um, know-how we have and the people we have here uh, this is very attractive for the startups yeah yeah great to, great great to learn about that i think and, and so do you see the same thing happening with the investment side as well uh, does that resonate with uh, the way uh, talent is moving actually uh, from the investment side, I would say that it depends on the startup and the sector, but we have many startups where uh, U.S. investors are invested or European ones. Yeah. I would say these are the main investors. We have some also from Asia, uh, but I would say focus is on Europe and, uh, and U.S. Oh, yeah. Okay. You also track that in the numbers, uh, Marcus, uh, that kind of behavior? <laughs> yes, we do. I don't have it ready now, but but we see that, and we saw that that really increased uh, during COVID. That before that, you investors still wanted to have FaceTime with startups, and that made things complicated. And afterwards, the whole investment sphere it really got completely international, and it was totally normal that an US investor would invest in an Austrian startup just after a Zoom call. So that 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 changed, and that also increased the available funding for Austrian startups uh, dramatically so that the numbers are really through the COVID time then suddenly it's increasing like crazy and now it's coming down again a bit because of the the general funding environment but but yes there was a big effect on that. And what we also uh, have heard from US investors is really that uh, when it comes to talent attraction Vienna is the city with the highest quality of life um, we have the talents from Central Eastern European, and it's affordable. Uh, so compared yes. to Silicon Valley, uh, we heard from several investors, they asked them, please stay in Vienna, because here you can afford the talents, you can get and hold them. 
Yeah. Uh, and th this was one reason or uh, two why they invested uh, in startups here in Vienna and didn't want to relocate them. Yeah, no, so I think that definitely from that perspective, uh, being on the crossroads of, of different regions with different perspectives and different development uh, uh, areas uh, is definitely really beneficial. Uh, it's nice to see that play out uh, like that and that the investors have also uh, found their way there. Do you also see that that has an effect on the incumbent industry? I think, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned already, Gabriele, that there's a, a high degree of participation in, for example, Vienna uh, uh, by industry leaders, but... Do you see that across the board as well, that everyone is, is really open to collaborate with uh, with startups and the innovative side there? Uh, uh, is that is that working well? Yes, uh, this is also, sh also shown by this uh, startup city networks we are uh, in. And we also try to build kind of a network with uh, stakeholders from Central Eastern Europe. And we have really very uh, many cooperation in activities with stakeholders out of this country because we really see the benefit and the synergies. It's not, it's not just that we all want all the startups to come to Vienna. It's really a two-way uh, cooperation because on the one hand, they want to enter new markets and our startups want to enter new markets. And the more you know uh, the people and you have easy access to important stakeholders, the, more you, the better you can help. And uh, this is really a very, very uh, good a partnership on an eye level we have here and it's everybody is really open and happy to exchange and see also to what works out in your city what doesn't work out and to exchange this experience and to improve these activities and to share this um, is really a very positive uh, experience yeah nice uh, how do you recognize that, uh, Marcus? Is that something that uh, is still part also in the, in the members of your organization? Do you see, is there a debate about how this works actually with uh, in the collaboration with the established uh, parties? Yes, for sure. I, I think uh, you have that challenge all over the world that uh, doing a cooperation between a, a, a very big but uh, definitely not agile big ship and, and, and a small speedboat this is always going to be challenging. The, 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 it's not easy and it's also dangerous for startups if if they put all their eggs into one basket and if they put all their awareness and all their work into this one basket and then there's not enough progress there. So I think you have to be aware of that and the discussions are obviously ongoing. But, but generally, you also have to just understand there are some players who are really serious about doing that, where there's buy-in from the top level, where it's clear decision-making structures. And then there are some for whom it's more like innovation theater and yeah. they're doing it because it sounds cool. So to be wary of that and find the ones who are serious about it, then I think you you can definitely get a lot out of that. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think as well, it's it's really important that to 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 on one hand understand that the the future of the ecosystem will always uh, consist of established players uh, mixed up with uh, with thriving new ones uh, in in a new constellation, which is constantly in development. Um, so that's uh, it's nice to see. In any case, that's also uh, taking off there in uh, in Austria. Um, I think uh, uh, what I'm curious about to pick pick up a bit more on is sort of the. Um, uh, are the, how, what are the banks play for kind of role in all this? So do you see that they're, um, uh, are they very active in, on one end, promoting, let's say, fintech, uh, fintech developments, uh, but are they also supportive of the startup ecosystem in general? Um, mm -hmm. Let's say the business model of uh, Silicon Valley Bank is not so fashionable these days. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, of course, let's say I, I did see, I do see from time to time that banks do take a proactive approach to supporting startups in the ecosystem. I'm mm -hmm. curious about that, how that's in, uh, in Austria at the moment. No, um, if I can start, uh, there, we have one organization, it's called um, the FinTech Austria, where all the big banks from Austria and uh, stakeholders who are interested in the FinTech area are working together and they organize every year the FinTech Week, which will take place yeah. this year in November. So this okay. is really yeah. um, shows that this collaboration between banks and startups is very much promoted and also this openness to invite others in order to be part of these uh, discussions uh, is very open. And they also plan now to make regular meetups in order to open up more. And in addition, we have this FinTech Ladies, this, which is an international organization, but also they are organizing since several years these, their meetups uh, in Vienna. 
And we have a bank, for example, as Marcos has already mentioned, who is doing its own accelerator program and also has a venture arm now. So there are several really very active um, uh, stakeholders out of the banking scene supporting these new innovations uh, and the startup scene. That's also reflected in the numbers. So especially if you look at Vienna, the city, it's about 8% of the startups are, are fintechs here. And, and that's also been uh, very much at the heart, at the beginning of the startup scenes in the early 2010s, fintech was was quite present. Uh, some some big names there. It's also one of the, the big neobanks in Europe. N26 has been founded by two Austrians. Mm -hmm. um, now yeah. one of the, the, the big unicorns in Austria, Bitpanda, it obviously also has a fintech character. Um, so I, I think it, it is a, a strong part of the Austrian ecosystem. Yep. <clears throat> and maybe in addition, it's also um, supported by the, um, uh, we have Comet, Comet centers. It's uh, um, centers for excellence in technology. And for example, we have one which is just dealing with uh, blockchain. So it's a blockchain center. And yep. there are uh, 70, uh, 17 research um, institutions and 61 companies are working together only on this topic. And then we have a Comet center for cybersecurity also with many research institutions, companies and stakeholders uh, working together in order to find new solutions for the problems we are facing. And this is also supported through grants from the national and uh, city government in order to really go into the, the, right, uh, the right directions. Yeah, great. Do you also see that other startups benefit from this, uh, Marcus? I mean, do you see crossovers between, for example, fintech, which is then a thriving part of the industry, with uh, other sectors uh, within the startup world? I mean, you generally have that crossover of, of talent that obviously you need a certain critical mass of, of, of talent available in the ecosystem so that then new startups can, can grow and have people who already have experience. So I think that's definitely a, an element that, that works there. You also see that from, from the government. So there has been a, a fintech sandbox. So they're trying out this sandbox model now specifically for the area of financial services, which is regulated. So you also, in some way, it's, it's, fintech is, is trying to push the needle on, on that level. So I, I think on that level, you have crossover effects, yes. Yeah, nice. Good to know. In any case, I think. Um, and so, do you uh, the, the curious also about sort of the the the, the impact of all of that, right? So, I think uh, uh, that was already mentioned that you see that quite some of the startups are actually focusing on impact in particular. I think across Europe now we see with the new uh, ESG legislation also coming from uh, from Brussels, uh, we see increasingly. Uh, in any case, that a lot of industries are finding it a challenge to comply with the needs of their data, reporting, uh, uh, and intelligence on this. Do you see that this is, is that sort of also changing uh, uh, the way that uh, startups are looking at this and are they jumping on this opportunity as well? Um, it's both. It's on the one hand, some know already that there is something coming uh, from reporting point of view. But what we really see is that um, we face many challenges and uh, startup founders are often people who really want, want to offer solutions for problems we are facing. And as the climate crisis is here already, aims we have um, this kind of solution. These people who really try to find, uh, make the things, we, the things we'll want to have. So, uh, and uh, the awareness is there. And I think it's also when it comes to investments to grant, I'm sure that in the next years, you will not get any investment or fund if you do not tackle these issues. So I think people are, are aware of that as well. Yeah. Do you see that as well, Marcus, uh, that it's sort of driving the, the on one hand, let's say, the, the way you do business, right? So if you're, if you're not uh, compliant and not coping with this, it, you just can't do it. As well as sort of looking at, perhaps sort of the rec tech perspective of this, uh, like our, our company is actually also coming up to jump on the on the opportunity to, um, uh, to, to, to help other companies with this. Yes, both. I, I remember when the European Green New Deal was announced that that was definitely seen as an opportunity also for startups to help with that transition. 
Um, but it's not just the, the green tech area, it's also the, the medical regulation area where we have now one new startup that has, I think, pre-product raised 2 million internationally um, based on helping uh, medical companies, medtechs, to, to comply with European regulation when it comes to medical devices. So this this space is, is moving. Um, but what we definitely saw over the last few years also, and really since we started tracking the data, there was a really strong growth in, in the number of companies that exist because they want to tackle a, a problem um, that faces society at the moment. So yep. this can be health, this can be uh, the environment, that can be the energy crisis, that can be uh, topics like um, inequality, the pension problem. So lots of different verticals where really they are solving something that in some way is relevant for all of us. Yeah. So it's all about purpose uh, in any case. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Food yeah. and social issues. It's a, huge, it's a huge market, you know. <laughs> if you look at uh, Firamisha City, energy, etc., if you have a good solution there, it's a huge market. Exactly. No shortage of uh, problems uh, there, right? So, no. <laughs> uh, so indeed, there should be more startups, right? I think the call for markets, uh, I think in the word that you, that you pronounced, I think that we, uh, I think across Europe, we probably still need to increase the number of uh, um, uh, new startup companies to try and help solve all these challenges. It's definitely worthwhile. Um, I think we should be actually wrapping up towards uh, towards an end here. Uh, maybe just really curious whether you have still a call towards our audience or something they definitely should know about the Austin ecosystem that you would like to share with them. Uh, Marcus, uh, how about you? <laughs> um, on the one, one hand, I, I would like to also share an event that we are organizing once yearly, the Austrian Startup Summit, where this year on the 3rd of May, we're celebrating our, also our 10th birthday with Austrian Startups. Okay. So if you nice. happen to be around, that's definitely a great opportunity. And uh, on the other hand, um, coming back to this goal of increasing the number of startups that are being founded, I think a big potential there still um, lies with with female entrepreneurs because those are all over Europe underrepresented. So creating a better environment for for those is 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 a strong opportunity, and I think Austria does have good numbers when it comes to that. So I think. Um, maybe this is, is is something where we can also play a role in making Europe a better place. Yeah, uh, just mm -hmm. curious, is that also something that's in focus uh, for uh, for your association to actually have a, a focus on that and support women in their journey towards entrepreneurship? Yes, for sure. I mean, we, we are not the only ones here. I think there's strong organizations out there who who are... Mm -hmm. I'm um, doing that too. There's um, the organization called Female Founders, uh, another yeah. one that's called Female Factor, who who try to push people to to start up. And actually, um, there's a fund now also coming from Austria, Fund F, who um, invest in startups that have at least one female co-founder and are doing that on a European level. So this yeah. is definitely a, a type of movement we have here. Yeah, nice. and also in the grant structure in our house, but also yes. national level, you get more money if you have also a woman in your founders team. And we have also um, uh, for female founders, incubator programs, etc. So it's really a big topic in many organizations. Okay. Yeah. And is, has that focus been around for, for a while already? Since years. Okay. Yes. Okay, well, good to see in any case if that's bearing fruit, uh, because I think quite mm -hmm. some countries across Europe are struggling as well with the same challenge. Uh, and it's 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 a challenging topic as it, you could basically start uh, uh, talking to, to, to kids at elementary school, because that's generally where the first biases start to appear uh, on whether you should go left or right with your with your career path. Right. So it's a, it's a, it's very deeply ingrained into our culture. Uh, what is the outcome? And so. Yeah, you can try to push graduates in a certain direction, but you're already quite a long way after years of shaping that you have to repair them. Yeah. Yes, we have such a program. It's called the Youth Entrepreneurship Week. And with, with that program, we, we go into schools and do project weeks on, on the topic of entrepreneurship. So we let cool. kids try out their own ideas, um, see how it feels to develop their own products. Um, 
prototyping, pitching. Um, and, and we have, have that goal in mind because, you know, in the 70s and 80s, we had that with skiing in Austria. Every kid in, in Austria could try skiing as part of a skiing course in school. And then if you jump 20 years later in the 90s, we had the, the international skiing competitions. We had races where the first nine places were only Austrians. Yeah. So if you open up the funnel, obviously excellence at the top prevails. So this is, this is what we're aiming for. Yeah, cool. Cool. Nice to nice to learn about that. Uh, and did, why did you stop the skiing program? <laughs> <laughs> good uh, question. It's still there. It's still there. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Maybe other countries just copied. Yeah. Uh, no, cool. Yeah. And Gabriela, anything from your end uh, that you would like to send yeah. as an invitation towards the audience? Yes, I would like to invite to come to Vienna, take a sailing boat, go on the Danube, eat afterwards a Sachertorte go to the opera house uh, and drink a real Viennese wine. We have Viennese wine and enjoy the culture and the startup ecosystem. And I would really love to welcome many of you also at Vienna Up or all the other international events we have here in order to check out if Vienna has something to offer for you. Great. That's, I think, definitely a great way to, to end the show uh, and definitely a great call out. Uh, I could already feel the water coming into my mouth uh, with your description there. So I'm, I'm, I'm booking uh, soon. Uh, That's cool. <laughs> now, thanks thanks for, for sharing your insights. I think it's really, really valuable to get a bit of an insight in the developments of the startup ecosystem in Vienna. Uh, so uh, thank you, Marcus, and thank you, Gabriele, for, for being so kind to share your time with us. Uh, and of course, we're happy to uh, connect any of the listeners that would want to get in touch with uh, with you uh, uh, later on. Uh, everyone who's listened in, uh, thank you very much for joining this uh, episode 172 of Breaking Banks Europe, uh, the ecosystem zoom in on the Austrian case. Looking forward to speaking to you again very soon. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to Breaking Banks Europe, a Provoke Media podcast in cooperation with Fintech Stage. Don't forget to tweet us out, shout out, or post to the team at Breaking Banks EU on Twitter. If there's something or someone you'd like to hear on our cast, let us know. See you next week on Breaking Banks Europe.